Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, and in case you missed the earlier announcement, we actually broke up this past month into multiple smaller videos, at least for large parts of it. And while I still will cover those here, if you want more information, you can go check out those separate videos on their own. Starting with papers that I've actually already done videos on, we're going to be looking at Stilatuberolethus, which was described in a new paper. As a new genus, it's essentially just an egg that has been placed into its own genus because we can't know what animal actually laid it. However, it also would have been fairly small, potentially even smaller than hummingbird eggs. So whatever did lay this egg was also very small, and it was also probably a dinosaur, as certain structures do help to show that it was probably related to the theropod dinosaurs. Additionally, there's other theropod dinosaurs that do show the kind of tubercles and bumps that are seen on Stilatuberolethus. However, they're set up and designed in different ways. Essentially, the way they're built isn't the same. So this is essentially something that's convergent, and they essentially used different methods to come to the same conclusion. Although, why they have these bumps isn't necessarily understood. There's also a paper on Shuvia, which is one of the best known alvarosaurs, which were a very strange group of dinosaurs with single claws on their hands and just very strange anatomy when compared to other dinosaurs. It was actually found to be probably nocturnal, and this is because of features in the eyes and in the ears, which suggest, again, that it was fairly similar to things like barn owls. I talk about these features more in my video on the paper. However, it does suggest that in a meg formation, where Shuvia comes from, essentially had distinct nocturnal and diurnal faunas. So even as far back as 70-ish million years ago, we were already getting complex and different faunas that were existing in a single place at different times during the day. Coming much closer to home for me in the next state over of New Mexico, there was a new ceratopsian described, named Menifee Ceratops after the Menifee Formation. This formation dates to about 81 million years ago, but there's a lot of leniency on that, because there hasn't been a great study done on exactly what the dates that constrain this formation actually are. However, this is about contemporaneous with the Fort Crittenden Formation of Southern Arizona, where another early centrosaurine ceratopsian has come from. Between these two species, essentially both coming from the southwestern United States, it does suggest that at least the centrosaurine ceratopsians, which did spread much wider across North America with animals like Styracosaurus, probably did start to evolve in southwestern North America or parts of Mexico. Unfortunately though, Mexico doesn't have a ton of rocks from this kind of time period, at least in the northern portions. So while there may be something we can find, hopefully in the future, we can't exactly hold out hope for that. However, the only way to know for sure is if people do get out into the field and try and find things. So hopefully we can get more people to go out there and do that. There were also two papers that I had separate videos on that discussed hadrosaurs. The first described a new genus, Tlatelophus, which I actually mistyped in my notes and then when I was recording the actual video, misspoke and called Tlatophus. So if you do watch that, be aware that I messed up. However, it is Tlatelophus and it's related to animals like Parasaurolophus, although there are a few other animals that may be even closer related to, like Chironosaurus and Blasiosaurus. These were all grouped together within the tribe Parasaurolophini, and it does suggest that there was actually a lot of diversity within at least that tribe, and additionally, it may suggest that because of the shape of Tlatophus's crest and the internal structures within it, that actually calling may have been a major factor in their speciation. There's an idea called sympatric speciation, where an animal splits off into two groups despite living in the same environment. If within birds, as an example, this could essentially happen because there's two different bird songs within a single species, and then different individuals of that species preferentially select for one of those songs. This essentially isolates those populations from one another. And what that effectively means is that they're separate it's as entire species because they're not interbreeding. And then from there, they can essentially specialize on those songs and become even more isolated from one another and potentially even select different foods. This idea is really hard to prove that it did exist in the fossil record. However, hopefully animals like Tlatophus will help us understand it in the future. The other paper looked at hadrosaur fossils, which are very, very fragmentary and don't really tell us much about the species, but just that they were hadrosaurs in South America, which the hadrosaurs didn't get to South America until very late in the Cretaceous, but once they got there, they seem to have done relatively well, largely because of an Atlantic sea transgression, meaning essentially sea levels rose. This would have added a lot of wetland type environments, and it seems like the hadrosaurs did better in those environments than their other relatives that were or in pods, but not hadrosaurs did on that continent. And so they were doing quite well in South America up until a giant rock hit the planet.
There's also a new species of Mosasaur described coming from Morocco. It was named Pleurodens serpentis, with the genus Pleurodens already having two species within it. Pleurodens serpentis helps to show that the Mosasaurs were still diversifying up until the very end of the Cretaceous, when it lived. And this is because the other Pleurodens species actually lived slightly before this, although still very close to the very end of the Cretaceous. And so they were still going through different changes and evolving in different ways. And so this is one of the major factors that would have helped them to become more successful if it hadn't been for that giant rock I mentioned earlier hitting the planet. Another thing coming from the oceans actually came from today's oceans and off the coast of Japan, and that's coral living on the stalks of crinoids. This is something we do find in the fossil record. However, the crinoids that lived then and the corals that lived then, because this only happened before the Permian Triassic extinction, are completely extinct. And that's because that extinction was just so severe that it killed off many of the different species that lived during that time. But the species we find doing this now are entirely different from the ones we find in the fossil record. Because before this extinction, these groups of corals and crinoids that exist today don't exist. We cannot find them before this Permian Triassic extinction. It's only that extinction that allowed them to diversify and flourish into the animals we see today. So this means that essentially this behavior evolved twice, and then also a third time because there is a sea anemone closely related to corals also found on the stock of one of these crinoids. So there's a lot of different events that have happened in symbiosis between the crinoids and the corals and their relatives. But now hopefully that we have a direct analog to what was happening in the fossil record, we can try to get a better understanding of why exactly this evolved. There was also a study on the growth of Massaspondylus, one of the earliest non-sauropod sauropodomorph dinosaurs. And they actually found that it had a lot of growth plasticity, meaning essentially different individuals would have grown at different rates. And you can see by this graph essentially every bar actually indicates a different amount of growth per line of arrested growth. Now, those lines of arrested growth essentially happen yearly, or at least probably yearly. Essentially, during rougher times, the animal would slow down its growth, and one of these bands would form in the bone. This type of plasticity would have been very good for Massaspondylus, which lived in the early Jurassic, a time period when there was a lot of different environmental changes happening, it largely due to climate change, and so that instability means that the plasticity would have been an advantage, because during rougher times, individuals could essentially slow down their growth and require less resources and then eventually start to grow to larger sizes once conditions improved. So essentially, this is something that's more basal and may actually be indicative of many of the dinosaurs that actually made it through the Triassic-Jurassic extinction and even survived during the Triassic when conditions were still even rougher. There was also research on the Proterosauria, which includes animals like Tanistrophius. Tanistrophius had a wildly long neck and it's been assumed that a lot of the early archosaurus forms were related to it and were related to each other. However, a new study seems to suggest that isn't necessarily the case, and even the term Proterosauria shouldn't be used because they're not that closely related. Now, when you look at the phylogeny that is made in this paper, you do see that they are all very closely lined up, and at least many of them were still related. However, animals like Prolocerta were actually outside of the main group of what would have been Proterosauria. This makes Proterosauria paraphyletic because it cuts out some of the descendants of a common ancestor. When we're doing cladistics and taxonomy though, that's not something we want to do because we want to try and be as inclusive as possible from all the animals that came from a single ancestor. They also do a lot of other taxonomy that I don't get fully into in my video because it's essentially just a lot of bone descriptions and descriptions of essentially what the synapomorphies are for each group. And synapomorphy just means it's a common feature between the two of them that makes them distinct from their ancestors. And so there's just a lot of that and it's very taxing to try and go through line by line. However, if you are interested, this paper is open access, so feel free to check it out yourselves. And last month, we actually talked about a paper that suggested the large ear canals in birds weren't part of flight like they had been previously thought to be. However, it does seem like the shape may have been according to this new study. So essentially, rather than looking at directly just the size of the ear canals, which do help with a lot of balancing and essentially 3D awareness. So this paper, instead of looking at just the size of the ear canals, also looked at the shape. And this is something that's important because the ear canals control a lot of our movement and our understanding of where we are in a 3D space. So the ear canals are super important to any animal's mode of locomotion. And this includes flying. 
by looking at a large set of different ear canals within a lot of different archosaurs, including some which were bipedal, some which were quadrupedal, and some which flew, including the pterosaurs additionally in this paper, the researchers were able to find a few patterns that essentially reoccurred. And there were fundamentally three of them, which is that there were some animals which were absolutely quadrupedal based only on their ears, some animals which were bipedal or had some limited flying capabilities based on their ears, and some animals which had advanced flying. So some fossil animals, like Archaeopteryx, actually plot fairly closely to animals that have some limited flying abilities today. So things like the galliforms or chickens and their relatives. This is a great paper for showing how you need to look at multiple lines of evidence to get a good idea of what was happening in evolutionary time. And I also hope that these two teams can come together and work together to try and get a better idea of that. Because understanding how the birds actually achieve flight is something that's still somewhat misunderstood. And hopefully we can try and figure it out. And speaking of that flight, there was actually a study that suggested that the first birds actually achieved flight because they were herbivorous. Being herbivorous means they would have needed to spend some more time foraging because plant matter doesn't necessarily contribute the same amount of energy to an animal as meat will. However, because there's less competition there sometimes, it can be advantageous to start eating plants. This paper found that the first birds were probably herbivorous, and this was done using genetic and ecological techniques. This means that they were probably under a lot of predation pressures, and any animal that could take off and escape faster would have become more successful. And so it's very likely that the birds essentially learned to fly and evolved to fly because they didn't want to get eaten by other animals, including some of their close relatives like the dromaeosaurs. And while flight has only been achieved a few times, even in the fossil record, we do actually see gliding occurring in the fossil record as far back as the early Permian, specifically in the Weigel's Swords. This new paper was able to essentially measure the different bone proportions and come up with this skeletal of what Weigeltosaurus would have actually looked like. You can see the long rib extensions that probably held a membrane, and this means the Weigeltosaurids were probably some of the first gliding vertebrates to exist. On top of this, they also did a phylogenetic study and found that they were actually very early diverging reptiles. And so what we do know about other early diverging reptiles like the Trypanosaurus is that they were doing some different things and had some weird anatomy, especially in animals like Trypanosaurus, whose arm anatomy is entirely messed up. So a lot of these early diverging reptiles were able to be successful at least until the late Permian or the Triassic because they were doing things entirely different from other reptiles at that time. And as we get closer into the Triassic with some of the groups we know more distinctly like the dinosaurs, there's been an argument about whether the Silosaurs were or weren't dinosaurs. But one thing we can tell is that their teeth were different from the dinosaurs, and that's because they had fused teeth. Dinosaur teeth were held loosely in sockets by a series of ligaments, and this is called gomphosis, and it's similar to what we see in mammals today, but also crocodilians. Silosaurs, though, they would have fully fused teeth, at least when the tooth was fully grown. There's good evidence, though, that at least during some part of the tooth's growth, it would have also had this gomphosis. And so it helps to indicate that there was a transitional stage where essentially young teeth would have been held by these ligaments and then essentially would have grown out of that. And then when we look at dinosaurs proper, they essentially never lost that and just kept the teeth loosely in those sockets with those ligaments. This probably helped them recover teeth faster. However, it's still not entirely sure if that's exactly the case. This is a cool study that I do get into more in the video, so you should check that one out because I really like this study. There's also the discovery of an amphibamiform from Antarctica. And I say amphibamiform because it's not an amphibian, or it is. The, the taxonomy and origins of amphibians are very poorly understood. However, this animal would have been closely related to amphibians if it wasn't one. Named Microfolis, its fossils have actually already been found in the Karoo Basin in the 1800s. But this is a second occurrence of it, which with about 30 species spread across the southern continents of Pangaea during the early Triassic when Microfolis lived, it's one of only two of those species that lived in different places. So it's something that really helps us to hopefully better understand how these animals were migrating and spreading across the continents, and potentially may also help us to understand why the amphibians are so specialized and why we can't necessarily understand better where they came from. And while the amphibians are required because of their lifestyle to spend a lot of time around water, there are some reptiles that also spend a lot of time around water, such as the genus Anolis, at least some of them. The common name for these is Anolis, and they live from parts of South America all the way up through to Florida, so they're very widespread. And some of them live near streams and can actually spend up to 18 minutes underwater, and they do this through rebreathing. 
For humans, rebreathers are essentially an invention that lets you breathe out into it. It collects that air, concentrates the oxygen, and lets you breathe it back in. And the anoles are able to do this because they capture a bubble on their skin, and then they can breathe back out into that bubble, and that helps to increase the oxygen concentration within that bubble, and then they can breathe that back in. This has been shown to happen in seminoles that aren't actually that linked to the water, although they cannot breathe and rebreathe this oxygen as many times as the ones which are more aquatic. So it is a very specific adaptation that evolved multiple times because the species that do have this aren't that closely related to each other. It's much more that they're specialized for water environments on their own separate islands or just places throughout the Americas. And so while this is dealing with modern species, we can use the lens of evolution to understand how the scales on these animals were used to help capture air bubbles and let them be more successful in these more aquatic environments. Earlier, I discussed a Mexican hadrosaur, Tlatelophus, and this time we're discussing another Mexican hadrosaur, Laterhinus, which was described from a number of bones found in a single bone bed, but they don't actually all belong to Laterhinus. Some of them do, but some of them also belong to a different hadrosaur that belongs to an entirely different group and also a small hadrosaur, which may also belong to that same group, and a small hadrosaur that belongs to Latirhinus's group. So there's a lot of bones within the single bone bed, which may indicate co-occurring species within the Sorolophines and the Lambiosaurines. Latirhinus would have been the Lambiosaurine representative from this bone bed, and so the Sorolophine representative still isn't actually described, and we don't actually know what it's made up of. With so many bones being assigned to the genus Latirhinus and then being found to not be Latirhinus, it did bring into some question whether or not we should actually use the name Latirhinus. However, the research did find that at least a forelimb, a hind limb, and parts of the pelvic girdle and tail were all from the same animal. And so that's the part of the animal that's being distinguished as Latirhinus. So it is still a valid genus, and hopefully we'll get some more research on the sort of loafing that's been found in the quarry as well. So that way we can try and understand how these animals were coexisting so well. Whales today either have teeth or they have baleen, which are used to filter feed. However, at least at one point in whale evolution, some of them had both. The primary example of that is Adiacetus. Adiacetus lived about 30 million years ago in the Oligocene. And some of the different canals that come through the top of the jaw help to show that there were probably baleen there. These would have been neurovascular canals and they essentially would have helped to provide nerves and blood to baleen, or at least primitive baleen. These are very representative and very similar to some baleen whales today. However, they also have the teeth that are very reminiscent of some of the tooth whales today. So they are very much a transitional species from early tooth whales into these baleen filter feeding whales. And this can hopefully help us understand exactly when baleen whales actually started to evolve because there has been some question to that because there's a lot of differences in some of the evolution of different whale groups. So hopefully this will help to bring a better story and understanding of how they got to what they are today. There was also a study which looked at the Permian-Triassic extinction, and it actually used drill cores to do this coming from Australia. The drill cores would section parts of the Permian-Triassic boundaries, and using the isotopes that were isolated within those cores, Researchers could try and correlate those to time, understand how the extinction actually took place, at least within Australia. What they found is a number of things. The first thing they found is that the Glossipterous trees, which are wildly dominant during this time, didn't die out until a period of particularly intense warming. So while there was gradual warming leading up until this last event, they were doing fine during that, but then died out after that more intense warming event. This means that animals that were trying to survive with those trees would have had less time to try and actually survive without them. Because once the environments were able to recover, they could start to fill in those different environments much easier. They also found that the inherent wetness that's needed in an environment, even if it's very isolated amounts of water, essentially never left, it just migrated. So while some places would be more dry at a single time than others, there would always be some pocket of wetness. And these kinds of little pockets may have actually helped the animals to survive through this extinction as while well, they wouldn't necessarily do great in every single place, they could always do okay somewhere. The Great Oxygenation event and the Logomundi event correlate pretty well. They're not perfectly in line with one another, although the Great Oxygenation event does cover the Logomundi event, and then the Logomundi event only lasts a slight bit longer than the Great Oxygenation event. Now, for understanding, the Logomundi event was a period of intense weathering on the continents, 
and would have led to a lot of minerals flowing into the ocean. The great oxygenation event was when photosynthesizers first evolved, and so they were able to produce massive amounts of oxygen that got added to the atmosphere. By looking at the minerals that would have actually been added to environments, researchers were able to help suggest an idea for how phosphorus, a key component of life as it does help build up DNA, may have actually gone into the oceans where many of these photosynthesizers actually were, and it could have actually helped them bloom into even more varied forms of photosynthesizers. What it suggests specifically is that kaolinite, a clay mineral, actually absorbs phosphorus, but only in fresh waters. Once it hits salt waters, it essentially releases the phosphorus in favor of other elements that are less compatible with water. So essentially, many of the salts that are present in salt water would have been absorbed in the kaolinite once it got out there. And as a clay mineral, it would be fairly easy for it to get picked up by different streams and carried out to the ocean, thus also carrying the phosphorus that was eroding out of different mountains out to the ocean as well. So while it may seem like you need massive events to happen in order to facilitate life, it may actually be a fairly unassuming clay mineral that helped life to achieve the diversity that it has today. Most birds today aren't very large, and they still grow relatively fast if they are relatively large, like ostriches. They will still generally reach about adult size within a year. But some of the largest birds didn't do this, such as Varombe Titan in Madagascar and the Moas of New Zealand. They would take a few years to reach adulthood. Once they reach adulthood, a different type of bone would start to grow on the leg bones especially. And these can help us understand how quickly or especially slowly once it reached that adult size, the animal would have grown because even that outside kind of bone can still have lines of arrested growth, which I've mentioned earlier. But Varombe Titan was limited to Madagascar and the Moas to New Zealand. And so that brings up a question where all of the much larger birds than we see today like this. To help understand this, some researchers did a histological study on Jenny Ornis, which is from Australia. So it had much more room to grow. And what they found is it actually was pretty similar to these other birds. It also would have grown slowly over a few years and then achieved massive size and then grown much slower from there. This may imply that even with evolutionary pressure, birds like ostriches may not actually be able to achieve the same kinds of sizes of these other birds very easily, as they may potentially also need to shift their growth style from being very, very rapid to prolonged over multiple years in the future in order to achieve these kinds of sizes. And so it's something we're not that likely to see. And when we're talking about birds, we should talk about the teeth they have, or may have had, especially in one specific genus, and it's actually only one genus that may have had them. Based on genetic data, it's believed that the birds lost all their teeth at once, at some event before the KPG extinction, and then essentially all birds from after that point inherited that toothlessness. But because the fossil record is never entirely clear, there's always one fossil that kind of trips those ideas up. The fossil of a gastornid bird, Omoranthus, was shown to have fairly large pits in parts of the jaw. And the gastorns are actually related to the anseriforms, or ducks. In fact, they're sometimes called the demon ducks because like the other birds I mentioned in the last study, they could also achieve massive sizes. But also being so closely related to the ducks means that potentially if they did have teeth, that the ducks may have also ancestrally had teeth and that teeth may have been lost multiple times within the bird lineage. Because of this, a new study was undertaken to try and understand if these holes in the jaw are actually tooth sockets or if they're something else. And what they found is that it's actually something else, which doesn't seem that exciting, but it does help us better understand how the genetic data and the fossil record can intertwine very well. Instead of tooth sockets, they found these holes to be cardiovascular canals, meaning they would have been helping to transport blood and nerve fibers into the lower part of the jaw. And so rather than being teeth, which would have been completely wild and unexpected, it's something that does make a lot of sense. And these canals are actually rather wide from what we do know of other birds. So it may indicate that they were doing something that was more sensitive and they needed more fine, delicate motor skills with whatever they were eating, because more nerve fibers there would have helped them be more sensitive to whatever they were doing. And finally, we have a paper that I'm not gonna be able to get as fully into as I want to because it's 41 pages long and I haven't had the time to get all the way through it yet. But it is very interesting and I will be doing a separate video on it. And that's because this paper is about Perius Scorpio, which was described actually in 2020, just a year ago, as the oldest known scorpion. But this paper suggests it's not a scorpion. So, you know, kind of a bummer, but still interesting because the results are very interesting and they do have 41 pages of data. So 
I'm sure there's some very good stuff in there. And even just the conclusions in this paper do suggest there's some parts of the evolution of the arthropods that we don't actually understand that well. And that's because this animal is found to be outside of most arthropods. It's outside of the chelicerates, which includes animals like the scorpions, but also horseshoe crabs, spiders, a number of things that have chelicerate, which are specialized limbs that aid in feeding, but also outside of mandibulata. And mandibulata has a lot of groups within it, such as the insects, crustaceans, and a few more. So whatever this animal is doing being outside and actually basal to them is very odd. It essentially doesn't line up well with anything that we currently have. And so with me just preliminarily letting you know this paper exists, its conclusions are interesting. And if Peria Scorpio isn't actually a scorpion, that's still okay. We do still have some pretty early scorpions. So it's not gonna change up a ton of things. It's just gonna be something that's more interesting and also suggests that the lager shot it comes from needs to be further studied. And I will get to this more in another video, I do promise, but this paper's long, it'll take me a bit. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks for watching. You know, this is our first time trying to burn through some of these faster, hopefully it actually worked. This next month of June, we're gonna try and keep up on them even more. Um, there's already been a lot of stuff out, so you know, it's gonna be a challenge. Hopefully it slows down later in the month so I can catch up. Be sure to check out our Patreon, where you can vote for the next What the Hell Is This Animal? And, you know, you can also just support the channel if you wanna do that too, that's cool. I I support you supporting the channel. I, I, I think that's it. So everyone, uh, you know, be safe, take care, don't go extinct.